Welcome. I'm Kevin Scott, one of the story architects of Star Wars The High Republic. This is Dominic Pace, who plays Gekko the Bounty Hunter from The Mandalorian. Hi, I'm Claudia Gray. I write Star Wars books. And you're listening. And you are listening to Star Wars Comics in Canon. The Force is strong with this one. Hello there and welcome to Star Wars Comics in Canon, your guide to the wider Star Wars canon through the comic book lens. And to take you on this journey, I'm your host, Mike Burton. And so brings another spoiler-free book review. So my friends, this is the final piece of High Republic content set in the Phase 1 of the High Republic, apart from the Star Wars Insider mini-comics, which are being released as a collection, I think, later this year. So I'll tackle them at some point. But for the 99 or 98% of the High Republic content has all been covered on the show Star Wars comics in canon. So if you're listening on YouTube, you can just go in the High Republic playlist. Or if you're listening on a podcast app, then type in the High Republic comics in motion and it will come up. That's every mini series, including Trail of Shadows and Monster at Temple Peak. That's all the main series. So the comics written by Daniel Jose Older, which are the High Republic Adventures comics by IDW Publishing, as well as Kevin Scott's Marvel published High Republic comics. So I've tackled all of those. I've done book reviews for all of them as well. And I've also, in my Rising Storm book review, I gave some information on the tempest runner which is the audio drama that kevin scott wrote about lorna d one of the leaders of the nile in the description i've also put a list of when each of the book reviews have been released all the way from the start which was light of the jedi back in march 2021 all the way to the most recent book review before this one which was mission to disaster in july 22 so the last you know year and a half i've been releasing a lot of book reviews and comic stuff about the high republic just so any of you listeners do get a really full well-rounded view on the high republic But with that all in mind, we're talking about Midnight Horizon, so it is chronologically the latest book in the High Republic era. We've got Phase 2 of the High Republic that has just kicked off, but that is set 150 years before Phase 1. That's setting off with the young adult book Path of Deceit, the junior novel Quest for the Hidden City, and the soon-to-be-released adult novel Convergence. So much like the first phase of the High Republic, it seems like, generally speaking, they're going to have three waves, and within each wave, they have a block of content. Normally a young adult book, an adult book, a junior novel, and then some comics go along with it. Usually it's like five comics for each kind of wave, because obviously comics come out monthly, so five issues of a comic is generally five months and then it's every six months or so is normally when they have another wave coming out and there are other mini series coming out there's a one shot called quest of the jedi written by claudia gray as well there's the blade of baldotta i think it's called but actually it's just the blade but it's about porter engel there's also the nameless terror that's going to be another one coming out so there's lots of bits and pieces obviously this is primarily a comics podcast but the high republic initiative although you could just read the comics and things would make sense the books really give a lot of weight to the story so I always recommend people pick up the adult novels of each wave and phase just so you have a good idea of things if you don't want to pick up every single piece of content obviously you can just listen to this podcast and get some information there and I will say if you've not listened to one of my book reviews before I'm just going to clarify that I generally split them into three parts within the episode you don't need to listen to three batches of episodes but the first part I will do my spoiler free thought give a bit of background information usually stuff that comes out when there's press releases and things like that so nothing that will ruin the book if you're planning on reading it then I'll give a little bit more information in part two give some very mild spoilers talk about the themes and characters a little bit mainly just stuff that happens over the first couple of chapters I'd say nothing that's really going to spoil the book and then I give plenty of warning and then give my full spoiler free book review including information on the book's plot and amidst that i'll then give extra information that i found interesting usually i find there's like a little passage i like to read in the book and i have actually got one here as well something about dealing with emotion which is quite interesting and i just give my more well-rounded thoughts without having to censor myself with worries of spoilers and then we kind of finish things off at the end and then obviously i just give a little bit of information of what's to come so that's what you can expect from this book review i obviously hope you do enjoy it But with that all in mind, let's get into things. So Midnight Horizon, as I said, it's the latest book and the last book in the timeline of Star Wars The High Republic in total, especially Phase 1, because Phase 1 is the latest in the timeline that we have. Now that means it's 230 years before the Battle of Yavin, so, you know, it's around 200 years before the Phantom Menace. 
and is around 100 years before the upcoming series Acolyte, which is being set technically at the tail end of the High Republic era as it kind of bleeds into the prequel era near enough to the Clone Wars and things like that. But that's generally where it kind of fits in the timeline. Now, with this book as well, there are many connections to other High Republic content, as there always is. But because Daniel Jose Older is the author of this, he also wrote the junior novel Race to Crash Point Tower, which I did review in February 22. And he also did the High Republic Adventures comics, which introduced Zine Mrala and Lula Talasola, who are both featured in this book as well. So what I found about this was this ties in very strongly with the High Republic Adventures third volume. There's actually parts of this where, right near the start, where there's a character that you follow and you actually saw what they were doing in the comics but then obviously it goes past that so if you've actually been reading the high republic adventures comics which i would recommend you know they're suitable for all ages but they are absolutely brilliant i I may even go as far to say i enjoyed them more than kevin scott's marvel comics don't tell kevin scott that if you're listening kevin i'm really sorry but i just i loved the high republic adventures and a lot of the themes in it and things i thought the artwork was incredible both comic runs are really good just to clarify but i I just especially like daniel jose older's um high republic adventures comics so obviously i did finish those off a while ago if you want to check those out you can listen to episodes 86 for the first volume 90 for the second volume and the annual and 93 for the third volume and the galactic bake-off which is a really fun issue to read as well so yeah 86 90 93 but in the description i'll have listed those as well so i would recommend if you haven't listened to those before go listen to those three episodes and come back or if you've read the high republic adventures comics or if you actually aren't that fast you just care about the books then you can listen on. So let's embark on the spoiler-free part of my review. So comparing this to the other two young adult books, which is Into the Dark and Out of the Shadows, I can't tell which is my favourite. Now, I did enjoy this book, don't get me wrong, but I have found that of the books themselves, the young adult books... I think are my least favourite collections. So I think that the adult books are the best. You know, they're the the major plot lines. They're where all the sort of big stuff happens. And then the junior novels often either bring a different perspective or focus on a slightly different story entirely. But because they're junior novels aimed at sort of 10-year-olds and stuff, they are so much easier to read. There's like three pictures normally within the confines of the book as well. And they're normally only like one to 200 pages, but the pages are so much smaller. It's kind of like reading about 90 pages of the adult books or maybe like 120 pages of the young adult books whereas like this book is 484 pages and most of the adult books are around 400 pages as well and i said their pages you know the font size is smaller and there's a lot more text on there so I find that the junior novels, they're, in my opinion, more enjoyable to read than the young adult because they are quite quick, they're quite fast, you get through things quite quickly. And I find that the adult novels, there's so much rammed in there that it takes a little while almost to process it in some ways. I find that the young adult books are kind of in the middle. I... I think this one was probably my favourite, even though it took me the longest to read. But I've just found with all three young adult novels, as much as I enjoy them, they have this thing, and I've used this word so many times in these reviews, but they have a bit of a lull in the middle. There's normally about five to ten chapters where nothing's really happening and it's not actually that enjoyable. And I found that with all three of the young adult books. I just feel like they're all a little bit too long. I feel like they're all probably about a 100 pages too long because... They take almost as much time to read as the adult books, but they don't have as much going on. They do focus on the characters a lot more, and I find that some of the romance elements that have been touched upon, more so in Out of the Shadows and somewhat in this one, they have been a draw for me. You know, I'm oddly enough, I've realized through reading is that I'm a sucker for romance in Star Wars, but not on screen, just books. I think it's because I can kind of, you know, Star Wars historically hasn't been the best at showing romance, uh, if we point to the prequels there. So it's one of those things that I find, especially when it's like teenagers when it's teenage love when they're not like kids when they're like forming into adults and they're kind of finding themselves and they feel like the whole world is against them but they found someone else who's a kindred spirit like i really like it when i get those kind of stories that's why people movies are often some of my favorites i love it when an outcast who doesn't really have anyone who likes them finds someone else who's also kind of an outcast and they just they experience happiness together That's the kind of thing I really enjoy. And I don't feel like these three books have really leaned into that as much as I potentially would have wanted to. I mean, I recently read uh, Padawan by Kirsten White. That's all about Obi-Wan when he was about 15. It's only within a couple years or maybe even a year of him being like taken on as an apprentice by Qui-Gon. So it's set still... 
I think it's like five or six years before Master and Apprentice, um, which is an adult novel written by Claudia Gray, which is also brilliant. But Padawan, I really, really enjoyed. And there's little hints of romance in that and little kind of hints of feelings in that, but they don't touch it too hard. But I just found that the young adult novels I've read outside of The High Republic are probably my favourite books. Aside from the Aftermath trilogy, which I absolutely adore, you've got Lost Stars, which I think is one of the best written Star Wars books that's out there, especially in the canon, um, but even including a lot of the legend stuff that I've read. You've got the Ahsoka novel, which is really cool. You've got Padawan, which is a really good book as well. And then you've got Leia, Princess of Alderaan, which completely surprised me with how much I enjoyed that. Obviously, that's not all the young adult books, but they're the ones I've read, and they've been among my favourites. But with The High Republic, I don't know if it's just because the adult novels are so good and the junior novels are so good that the bar's a bit higher. I- I'm not really sure, but it's not even the authors. I don't put any blame on them because Daniel Jose Alder's obviously comics, they're among my favourites of Star Wars, and his junior novel, Race to Crash Point Tower, is my favourite junior novel. And then Justina Ireland, she wrote A Test of Courage, Mission to Disaster and Out of the Shadows. And in all three of those, Vanessa Rowe features quite a bit. And Vanessa Rowe is one of my favourite characters in Star Wars as a whole. She's so interesting and I could just read books and books and books about her. And then I'm given them and I really enjoy them. And I want to clarify, even though I am critiquing the young adult books to a degree, I do not think they're bad in any way. I still think they're worth reading and there's lots of cool stuff in them that I do enjoy. I have just found with this phase, they haven't gripped me in the same way. With the junior novels, I normally blitz them in like two weeks, if that. Uh, The adult novels take me longer to read, but once I'm kind of hooked, I will not put the book down in a way. I'll always make time every evening to read them. With all the young adult books, when I've been... Normally I read in bed, you know, Megan goes to bed, my partner, if people don't know all the ins and outs of my personal life and listen to every other podcast I do. But she normally goes to bed like 10-ish, to 10 or 11, and I normally stay up until like midnight, 1-ish. So normally in that time, I do a lot of my Star Wars comics reading, and I do a lot of my book reading and other stuff as well. But I've just found that there's not really been that point where I'm absolutely hooked with any of the adult novels until I'm like two thirds through the book. That's normally when the the final act kind of comes through and all the stuff starts to happen. But it shouldn't really take me reading, you know, two to three hundred pages of a book to get hooked. So I'm I'm very intrigued to see what phase two is going to be like, because phase two actually starts with the young adult novel, whereas what's been happening in phase one is the adult novel and the junior novel get released, and then the young adult novel gets released like a month later. But what they've been doing for phase two, I think they've learned a bit where everyone's like, oh my god, one month, and then you've basically got three books to read. They've done it a bit staggered. So Path of Deceit came out sort of early October, but in the UK or outside the US, it actually comes out in early November. So I still haven't got my copy yet, even though I pre-ordered it ages ago. And then like a couple weeks after that, the junior novel got released or gets released and this is a quest for the hidden city and then i think then a month after that is when convergence comes out so i think over like the six weeks or so is when they release the three books maybe to two months is over the three books whereas with phase one it was just four weeks it was the first week you get two and then the fourth week you get the other one so i'm interested to see if people prefer it that way i know certain people still haven't got through the high republic which there is a lot of content i do understand i've basically been unable to read almost anything else but I'm interested because Path of Deceit, they're saying, is arguably the most important book of this first wave, and it's a must-read. And the fact they're putting so much weight on the young adult book, I'm intrigued to see if Path of Deceit is better than these three books have been. As I said, I still really enjoy them, and the characters are really interesting. The plot is good, but I just find that, again, with the young adult novels, they're trying to make the stakes as big as the adult novels but you can kind of feel they're not whereas the junior novels don't try and do that the junior novels have much lower stakes but they're much more about the characters and the young adults kind of fit in the middle there's these really big stakes but they're not quite as big as the the adult novels and then their characters get kind of looked into but not in the same way the junior novels do and as i said they're very wordy and there's just a lot of stuff that you read and it's like is this actually going anywhere And although I really like the third act in this, and I did really enjoy it, and like one of the standout characters is one called Crash. Uh, Crash actually appeared in the Star Wars High Republic Adventures annual, which I tackled in the second volume of Star Wars High Republic Adventures. So I think that was episode 90. And there's a story in that, which is like Crash and the crew do something. So you actually get to see Crash and her doing her job. She's like a bodyguard-ish. I'll delve into that when I'm in the less spoilery section. But she was a standout character for me, and she's almost, apart from that one small appearance elsewhere, she is an exclusive for this book. Much like, I think it's Sylvester Yarrow was, or Chansey Yarrow, one of the Yarrows in the young adult book, Out of the Shadows, she was only in that one book as well. I think it's the daughter, her mum was in uh, Fallen Star. But 
Aside from that, we've got characters who have appeared in prior content, and I, I really enjoy it, and there's some flashbacky parts that you get about one of the characters, and you find out about their backstory, and I did enjoy it, but once again, I felt like it was one or two chapters too much. I, I just feel like these books have need to get reined back a bit, ju- just by maybe 10%, I'd say, maybe even 20%, and they would be so much tighter that I feel like, for me personally, they would work a lot better. So, that's kind of my thing. I just keep, kind of keep saying the same thing over and over again, but it's kind of hard to give a review on this without delving into the minutia of the plot and itself. It's based generally on Corellia. You know, there's thoughts that there might be a Nile plot there, but at the meantime, there's like something going on on Gus Talon. I think it's like a, a union dispute or something. Gus Talon is one of the moons of Corellia. And so all the Jedi on Corellia all go straight to this dispute on Gus Talon. I think all of them do, or maybe like one or two are left behind but there's not really anyone left. And I was like, that's... I know the point of this is that it's meant to be a bit stupid and that's kind of how it starts, but I'm like, that is that's a lot for the Jedi to do, to send everyone away from Corellia, which is one of the core worlds, which is one of the main cities. You know, it's kind of like the working class equivalent of Coruscant in a way. Coruscant is kind of like the corporate elite. You've got the richest of the rich in Coruscant, as well as a lot of the very, very poor, but it's depending on where levels you fit in Coruscant because it goes down by like thousands of levels. But on Corellia, it's a bit more of like an industry. It's the industrial world. They make, like, they've got all the shipyards there. So that's where they make a lot of the ships in Star Wars. And it's such an important planet. And you just think you've just left it completely. It's because the Jedi think that the Nile are all, basically all but wiped out. And th- they do explain it in the book. And I'm not, once again, this isn't like necessarily a problem with the writing. It was just one of those things I was like, oh, okay, I guess. I, it, I say it's not a problem with the writing, but I think maybe it's just too convenient. I feel like it's such a gaping hole in the Jedi. But once again, I don't know if that was the point. You know, the prequel era Jedi seemed a bit rubbish and useless. And giving George Lucas the benefit of the doubt, he was meant to make them look that way because then that kind of gives Palpatine's rise, you know, a lot more weight. It basically means that he was right about a lot of things and that they were clearly so preoccupied with this and that that they didn't actually look at things properly. I don't know if I'm thinking about it too much, but I did still enjoy it. I thought this was really cool. I did really enjoy the ending. And I would say this probably lagged the least of the three books, I think. But that might be just because of Crash. I found that character to be very interesting and they kind of kept me intrigued while I was still kind of going on and things and while I was doing other stuff. So that, I think, is my spoiler-free review for now. Now, I'm going to give yourselves a bit more information before I delve into my mild spoilery thoughts, and that's going to be me reading you the blurb. So, here is the blurb of Midnight Horizon. After a series of staggering losses, the Republic finally seems to have the villainous Nile Marauders on the run, and it looks like there's a light at the end of the tunnel. But then, word comes of a suspected Nile attack on the industrial cosmopolitan world of Corellia, right in the galactic core. Sent to investigate are Jedi Masters Comac Vitus and Cantum Psy, along with Padawans Wreath Silas and Ram Jomaram, all fighting their own private battles after months of unending danger. On Corellia, Wreath and Ram encounter a brazen young personal security specialist named Crash, whose friend was one of the victims of the Nile attack. The Padawans team up with her to infiltrate Corellia's elite, while the Masters pursue more diplomatic avenues. Working with Crash proves more dangerous than anyone expected, even as Ram pulls in his friend, Zine, to help with an elaborate ruse involving a galactic pop star. But what they uncover on Corellia turns out to be part of a greater plan, one that could lead the Jedi to the most stunning defeat yet. So it's interesting to hear how much plot is actually given away just by the blurb, as in I never read the blurb for the High Republic books because I know I'm going to buy them all, so I'm just going to read them. I don't want anything to be kind of spoiled for me or any little lines of it. And I'm glad, actually, because there's a line in that that I was like, oh, one part of that isn't really even mentioned until like two thirds through the book, I want to say, maybe maybe halfway, but that would have maybe a little bit spoiled it. Um, but yeah, I never read the blurbs for uh, these books at all. For the books that I get that are non-High Republic for Star Wars, I do read them, but normally because I listen to them on audiobook, because obviously I need to know what on earth I'm potentially buying. But with a High Republic, I'm like, yep, yeah, High Republic, I'm trying to read it all and complete it all. So I'm not going to read the blurb. That's a lot of me just saying about the blurb. Sorry about that, friends. Um, But with that in mind, we move on to the next part of the review. So this is the mild spoilery review. So I'm going to give a little bit of context, a little bit more depth, talk about the characters a little bit more, and talk about the general plot in a bit more detail. So let me just read yourselves the crawl. The tragic events of the Republic Fair have galvanised the galaxy. The Jedi and the Republic have gone on the offensive to stop the marauding Nile. With these vicious raiders all but defeated, Jedi Master Avar Chris has set her sights on Lorna D, the supposed Eye of the Nile, and has undertaken a mission to capture her once and for all. 
But unbeknownst to the Jedi, the true leader of the Nile, the insidious Marquion Roe, is about to launch an attack on the Jedi and the Republic on a scale not seen in centuries. If he succeeds, the Nile will be triumphant and the light of the Jedi will go dark. Only the brave Jedi Knights of Starlight Beacon stand in his way, but even they may not be enough against Roe and the ancient enemy that's about to be unleashed. So I said before, I think in other reviews, that the, the opening crawl for the books and things, they're set depending on the wave of each phase. So that crawl is the same as what we got at the start of The Fallen Star and what we got in the start of Mission to Disaster as well. Even though with this one in particular, with Midnight Horizon, it's not really relevant. I mean, it, it tells you where it is in the galaxy, so it's kind of subtly telling you it's in wave three, phase one. I feel like they should probably just put that in the book, like in the start. It would probably mean that people are more easily understanding of what the time timeline is and stuff but you know all of that crawl there's not even really any of it that's mentioned in this book apart from right at the very end but putting that to one side so here are some thoughts that are mildly spoilery i'm going to talk about the first few chapters really some of the characters and some of the themes but still it won't be major spoilers so you can still enjoy this book so we've got a handful of characters that pop up so we've got wreath silas who has been in all of the young adult novels into the dark is when he was introduced and then he was in out of the shadows and then obviously this book then his master comac vitus he has been in the books as well he's actually been in the same young adult books that uh, wreath has been in his introduction was in into the dark as well then you've got Cantum Psy. Now, Cantum Psy was introduced, I believe, in the High Republic Adventures comics. He might have appeared in the background of a couple of other places, but that's where I know them from. Now, Cantum Psy is an intriguing character because they do not identify as male or female, so they are non-binary. So whenever their pronouns are used in this, it's not he or she, it is they. And I find that's important for representation, and Cantum is a really, really interesting character, one of the standouts of the book. There are flashbacks that I mentioned in the non-spoilery review, uh, which are specifically about Cantum Psy. And the flashbacks start fairly early, but he, in essence, had some issues with the Jedi Order when he was a teenager, and Yoda was actually his master. And so at a point, he decides to leave the Order, and the flashbacks all kind of follow that. If you want more information on that, either pick up the book, or in the spoiler part of the review, I'll delve into that a bit more deeply but Cantum Psy is one of the focal characters of this book. Then you've got Ram Jamaram. So Ram is one of my favourite characters in all of the High Republic. He is probably my favourite character in this whole book. He was introduced in Race to Crash Point Tower, uh, which was obviously another book by Daniel Jose Older, which is probably my favourite junior novel, I'd say mainly because of Ram. His interpretation of the force is really intriguing he's very mechanical he loves fixing things and so when he uses the force he kind of views it almost as a giant mechanism and he has a unique ability that a lot of other jedi i don't think i've actually seen elsewhere is that he can feel an engine running he can like in i think race to crash point tower is an example is he's got like a speeder bike chasing him and he's on a speeder bike and he can feel inside the other bike where all the wires and stuff are so he just uses the force to like pull out a wire which was like the brakes or something or the steering and just by doing that very minor action it makes the enemy vehicle completely unusable and he does that in this book as well to a degree that i won't spoil here but he's just got a really interesting view of the force he's quite young and peppy but he still questions himself a little bit he loves saying so wizard so he's like the first person in canon to say so wizard which is the somewhat infamous phrase that in the phantom menace was mentioned by one of anakin's friends and in this book, it's very funny whenever he mentions So Wizard, all the characters are like, what's he saying? Why is he saying So Wizard? I assume that's a good thing. It sounds good. And that happened in the High Republic Adventures comics as well, because after Race to Crash Point Tower, the last half, I think, of the High Republic Adventures books then feature Ram in them. It's either the last half or the last like four or five, but he starts popping up in the High Republic Adventures books when he starts to become a lot closer to Zine Rala, Lula Talasola, and a lot of the young Padawans as well, like Quart and Fasala. So it's really cool to see him interact with those characters and i can't get enough of ram then we move on to crash so her name is actually elise ongwa but her nickname is crash she is essentially a bodyguard it was mentioned in the blurb that i read to yourselves and she is the local she's i think born on corellia she's been there her whole life and she runs this kind of bodyguard security agency and she's a very switched on individual she's the same age as wreath silas so she's about two years older than ram but still a teenager 
And then the other main character is Zine Morala. So Zine Morala, she is a Mickeyan, and that means she has lots of head tendrils and stuff. Um, you can see her, she's from issue one in the High Republic Adventures comics. Her and Lula Talasola are the main characters in the High Republic Adventures comics. Most of the, especially the early issues, but most of the issues kind of follow their two separate journeys and how they intertwine and things. And they're both individuals who are a similar age and have similar struggles, but have had completely different upbringings. And it's just really interesting with Zine. She's a very intriguing character, especially in in this book and the later issues of the High Republic Adventures. Her kind of finding her way in the universe is something that's very intriguing because she's very strong in the Force. She's incredibly Force-sensitive, but she was never picked up by the Jedi. And so she's lived her life trying to repress this because she was a part of this community and they all said the Force was evil. So she was repressing herself and who she was. And in doing that, her and her friend Crix, they basically became at odds with each other. So at the start of the High Republic Adventures, when the Jedi get introduced and Zine shows her force sensibility, Crix feels betrayed by that and is still brainwashed thinking it's bad, so he goes off and defects and joins the Nile, whereas Zine joins, obviously, the Jedi Order. She doesn't become a fully-fledged Jedi, but she becomes like an associate, an acquaintance, as it were, and she gets trained a little bit in the Jedi arts, but is mainly kind of there as a support sort of thing. Like the Jedi, they're supporting her, trying to help her, but they say we can't let you be an official Jedi. And so because of that, she wouldn't get her own lightsaber. She has used other people's lightsabers quite a lot. And there's even a part in this book she uses Ram's and Ram makes a mention that he's allowed her to use his lightsaber quite a few times. But she's got a really unique perspective. I don't think we've really seen much in the canon of a Force-sensitive person who's not just Force-sensitive like Maz Kanata is, who's, you know, can sense the Force but can't necessarily use it. We're talking about someone who can full-on move things with their mind, can Force choke, Force push, do all those sorts of things, and she's never been trained. So she's got this raw power behind her. And so she's really, really interesting as well. And her story is the one that the first probably quarter or maybe third of this book runs alongside the High Republic Adventures comics. So as the High Republic Adventures comics end on issue 13, then Zine is kind of separated from Lula Talasola. They go off and do their own things. And then this is getting to see what Zine actually did. Uh, and it's, it's really interesting. So there are a couple of chapters that are slight overlap, but obviously Daniel Jose Order wrote them. So there's still interesting parts to even if you read the Adventures comics, it's still really interesting hearing Zine's part. So they're sort of the main characters. We don't really follow an antagonist in this very much. I'm just trying to remember in my mind. It's more of a mystery of what's going on in this. Whereas in like The Fallen Star, we know what's going on from the get-go. We've always got these chapters of one or two antagonistic characters or groups of antagonistic characters at least. So with The Fallen Star, it's the inverse of that. But in this, yeah, we don't get any perspective. There's a an antagonist who shows up in the High Republic Adventures comics and she's an Icarus. I think is her species. I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but I thought she was going to be quite a major player in this. And then she's only in it a very small amount. So it's interesting seeing that with this perspective that it just follows lots of different characters all having like a piece of the puzzle, trying to work out really what's going on. And with this, one of the major themes in this book is I think dealing with trauma. So you've got Cantum Sai who has flashbacks and you see their kind of life and where they didn't jive with what the Jedi were doing and then how that kind of unraveled from there. You've got Wreath Silas, who's been really feeling like he's kind of not found his place yet in the universe. He's kind of, he's still going along, but he's quite headstrong. But he's, you know, he loves reading and stuff. But as the war has gone on between the Jedi and the Nile, Wreath has kind of come out of his shell a lot more. He's a lot less wanting to just sit on Coruscant and read loads of hollows and books and things. He wants to go out and explore a bit more because his master, Kermak Vitus, is a massive fan of artifacts and old temples and things like that. So Wreath manages to go around and search all those things. Now, with Kermak Vitus, something is really wrong with him and you don't really find out to right near the end. So I'm not going to spoil it here, but just throughout the book, there's this constant thing of something isn't quite right with Comac and Cantum Sai especially can really feel that because Cantum and Comac are together for the vast majority of this book, just like Wreath and Ram are together for the majority of this book until they are then joined by Crash. So then we've got Ram. So Ram has got this thing where he keeps feeling quite numb about stuff. He doesn't feel the emotions he used to feel about any of these kind of things. And he's, he's kind of struggling a bit with it because he's still quite upbeat and peppy and quite joyful. But for a lot of it, he says he's feeling numb and he, he doesn't really feel that much excitement. There are points in which he has exciting moments and then he feels himself again. But when he's out of that, he then feels a bit flat. And that's kind of tackling things where A, being busy all the time can make someone sort of burnt out in certain ways. But also, once again, this whole thing about trauma, because all these Jedi have seemingly been at peace their whole lives. And then suddenly they've had about a year and a half, I think, from Light of the Jedi to this point of 
constant war. I mean, there are points where some of these Padawans aren't necessarily at war necessarily and are in constant battles, but they do reference in the book that especially the last, I think, few months leading up to this book, so between the Rising Storm and, and the Wave 2, all the way to this final wave of the first phase, it's been several months, I think it's about six months-ish, three to six months, and in that time, because they've been on the offensive, as the crawl said, they've been pursuing the Nile, they've been going after them, they've been starting fights with the Nile, so there's a lot of elements where they've really been violent and having to do these things that they've always been taught not to do, and their entire lives have been turned upside down. So a lot of that kind of comes into play of when you're in a war and then you come away from battles, how you're feeling, dealing with trauma and things like that. So there's so many layers to this. Then you've got Crash, who's got some, not quite imposter syndrome, but she is someone who sometimes feels she's in over her head and she has trust issues. She has a lot of walls up. She tries to use the excuse that it's part of the career that she's in when you're in security. You can't always just tell everyone everything about yourself. A, she's insecure and things, and she does use it as a bit of an excuse, but also she's, you know, trying to be the leader of this organization while all these things are going wrong around her, while she's also a teenager. So she's also trying to find her own way in herself, regardless of all the other outside factors. So once again, with all the young adult books, it's always about finding yourself in your place in the galaxy. But this one seems to have a lot more dealings with trauma. And when these certain events, when your environment changes around you, or when the world changes around you, how do you fit into that? And I think that's probably telling with obviously covid and the lockdown and how that has been affecting the world the coronavirus but then also reining it back a little bit more and maybe even an adult in a world with the internet that's never really been involved with it there's so many layers of things that you could apply for social commentary that works with this that i think those levels of it really work and i know that in certain circles online, I know that uh, RuPalp's Pod Race, for example, who obviously I spoke to Claudia of RuPalp's um, on Genuine Chit Chat um, a couple months ago, and she was delightful. And RuPalp's is a really fun um, LGBTQ positive podcast. And in that, they always talk about Midnight Horizon. And I think a big part of that is A, the things I've just spoken about, which is coming of age. There's a lot of LGBTQ plus stuff in this. Obviously, Cantum Size is non binary. And then there's other characters that I won't mention until we get to the spoilery part who are not necessarily struggling with their sexuality but they're having a sexual awakening and they don't seem to be a heterosexual. So it's a lot of representation that obviously, especially people in the LGBTQ plus community really appreciate, but also just not making a big deal about it in the wrong way. Just having it as something that's normal. Cantum Psy, there's no part in any of the comics or in this book where someone questions it or goes, they, why are you a they? Why are you not he or she? You know, there's no, there's none of that in this. Cantum Psy is just Cantum Psy and they are who they are and they just move on with it and it's about them as a character and that's kind of going against the tokenism which is something that's very important uh, in all realms of reality but especially in Star Wars where there has historically not been the most amount of people of colour on screen there's not been a huge amount of LGBTQ plus stuff especially not in the movies and obviously with the Disney era sequel trilogy you would have thought there'd be a lot more and there just wasn't anything for ages and then there was one same sex kiss between two women and that was like it and it was like meh yeah, that didn't leave a good taste in most people's mouths who are kind of waiting for that sort of thing. But the High Republic has really helped with pushing some of those things forward to try and make LGBTQ plus people and lives normal. Having characters that are in that community that aren't just allies, that aren't, you know, cis heterosexuals like myself are people who are a part of those demographics and being represented in an apt way in a fair way in a proper way and so i think that that's one of the reasons this book has done very well among a lot of the lgbtq plus individuals in certain communities because it has such good representation in that and i just want to highlight that that although myself when i read that you know when i read about quantum sign things i will say that the only thing and this isn't going against anything i'm not trying to make a statement or whatever but because Cantum Psy is they, when you read certain passages of their flashbacks, there are points in which it's kind of hard to tell whether the they is referring to just Cantum or if the they is referring to Cantum and the person who is with Cantum throughout most of the flashbacks. And that's, once again, that's something I've just, it, it took more of just to reread the sentence or you understand from context. But I would say anyone who is going to be reading these books, be aware of that if you haven't read many books that have got non-binary individuals in there. But once again, it doesn't take away from the book or the enjoyment and the representation there is really, really good. Now, there's some other sort of tidbits and things I'd want to mention, which don't spoil any of the plot that I want to kind of get into a bit. So one of the things is speaking about Cantum. So Cantum Sai and Torben Buck, aka Buckets of Blood, um, he's one of my favourite characters as well, but he only shows up in the High Republic Adventures comics. He's a lot of fun. 
They have a force-based connection that they intentionally sort through via intense meditation. So I found that quite an interesting concept. So they can kind of communicate throughout the galaxy. They can kind of they, they have this connection that you can only really get by fostering that sort of thing. And that's actually delved into in the Galactic Bake Off special, which I did tackle back in episode 93 of Comics and Canon. That's amidst the finale of the High Republic Adventures comics. And in that, it kind of shows how it somewhat started. And in this book, it gets mentioned further and it gets kind of enhanced more. So I really like when we get more force abilities or more force connections and things. And that is, as I've said multiple times, one of my favorite elements of the High Republic, seeing how different people interpret the force seeing certain uh, like battle meditation is what Avar Chris kind of uses that's what it's called in Legends um, things like that and there's also something else I wanted to mention where where this is on Corellia then you've got Lady Proxima's kind of gang in a sense now they're not necessarily called the White Worms I can't remember off the top of my head but in the book Crash has some run-ins with the Grindelid clan. So the Grindelid are the species. Now in Solo, we've got Moloch, who is a person who's pursuing Solo for a decent chunk of the movie. And then you've got obviously Lady Proxima, who was the main sort of runner of the White Worms. So they're Grindelids. They're from the planet Persis 9. Now Grindelids are in this quite a lot because the way the book kind of starts is one of Crash's good friends and employees, who is a Grindelid male, he gets killed by having some of his clothing ripped off in sunlight and, you know, sunlight burns them as we saw in Solo. So it's interesting seeing more Grindelids and you get a bit more information on the hierarchy and the power struggle and kind of how they function on Corellia. Obviously, this is set around 200 years before The Phantom Menace, so I think it's about 220-odd years before the events of Solo, sort of thereabouts. Um, but yeah, I just I just found that interesting because Grindelids are quite an interesting species to come into the new canon. So one thing this book also does right at the start, as I kind of mentioned it earlier, was with the High Republic Adventures comics, there is a point where certain characters leave to do one mission and certain characters leave to do the other mission. And in that, you actually get to see what these are some of the other characters you know that's what ram gets up to and stuff like that there's also quite a few cool things in here you get to understand like how corellia kind of works and one thing that daniel jose older did in this book that isn't in any of the other high republic books thus far and i don't know how i feel about it but he split it into parts so there's five parts and they each part has a specific divider and the pages are like black with like white writing on it looks very cool but i didn't find it necessarily added anything to the book i thought it was going to be quite something quite substantial or there's gonna be like a big flashback or something but not really it, it didn't i don't know why he did that maybe it was something i wanted to try out i'm not overly sure but that's in this book and i just didn't really feel like it added anything i didn't feel like reading it with parts made any difference to how i've read other high republic or young adult novels so I thought I'd just mention that didn't really make an impact to me. But it looks nice. And when you turn a page, it's all black. It looks quite cool. So it also goes into information of like some of the the elites of the class on Corellia. So Crash has to protect a couple of people who are high ups. And you get to see there's one or two events that she attends with or without some of the other characters. And you get to see some of the things behind the scenes there. You get a bit more lore, some cool characters that are kind of mentioned or like cool organizations that are mentioned. And there's also celebrity culture. And celebrity culture, this is one of the first times it's really been mentioned in the Star Wars canon that much. So aside from people who are like heroes of the war, or figureheads, you know, like Mon Mothma or Bail Organa or obviously Leia later on, Luke Skywalker, people like that. Like, I'm talking about actual celebrities in the universe. So there's a character called Savino. I think it's S-apostrophe-V-I-N-O. And they're a friend of Crash's and they're like this massive, massive pop star. And so you get to see like how they feel about being a pop star, how Crash kind of interacts with this person, how that kind of goes about. And then part of the plot, which actually once again gets mentioned in the blurb, which surprised me, is this thing with a galactic pop star where they try and like create a new one in a sense so i won't say anything else about that in particular but i just thought it was quite a cool concept to put into place and i haven't really seen much of that in star wars before so I think those are most of my thoughts in this um, that aren't like spoilery. I've kind of delved into some of the characters, some of the themes, my general ideas of the plot. And I have found, I said, like, I did enjoy this book. I found the pacing much like the other young adult novels. It just wasn't quite grabby enough. It just, There were just a couple of lulls I found. Maybe like part three, I'd say, maybe part three was probably the bit that was the weakest for me maybe part four but as i said i still did really enjoy it and i found it started off really strong and i really enjoyed daniel jose older's writing he's got there's a lot of sort of comedic elements in it that kind of bounce off uh, ram john ram more so but he's quite a fun character and i i suspect that daniel jose older kind of views ram maybe as a young version of himself or something like that because there's just a lot of cool things that i really appreciate about that character some of the internal thinkings and etc so just before I delve into the spoilery parts of this, I just want to read a little passage from page 354 of Midnight Horizon. 
this is something about dealing with emotion that I just found was quite interesting. It's not that long, um, but I think it's a good way to kind of give some insight into what a lot of Cantum Sai's journey was like and his time away from the Jedi Order especially. I just found it to be very interesting. Uh, so I'm just going to read a small passage from the book. So here is a passage from Cantum Sai speaking with Yoda. This is in a flashback and Cantum Sai has just said detachment. And I am going to be skipping over some parts of this. I don't want to just read two pages to you. I'm just going to kind of select parts. But this gives you a good idea of parts of the book and parts I especially liked. Yoda nodded, serious now. To let go, elusive it is, but also always available to us, always there. And then, when we grasp, gone again. It takes practice, it does. Repetition. To have to do it again does not mean we have failed, only that we must do it again and again. Hmm. Cantum knew the truth of those words in their bones. How many times had they managed to let go of doubt, fear, arrogance, jealousy, only to have each tumble back in like nothing ever happened? Yoda is right though. Those weren't failures. The struggle, the lesson, really was all simply ongoing. Who but the young can offer us this lesson, hmm? Over and over, we must learn to let go. To love is to let go, Yoda said, watching the flames. To be Jedi is to let go. His eyes seemed unfathomably sad suddenly, but then he smiled, and his smile was a real one. I taught you this lesson, Cantum said, realising it was true as the words came out. Easy, you think it was, to send you into the galaxy that day? It hadn't even occurred to Cantum that Yoda had struggled with that moment. He'd seemed so poised, so level about it all. I... yes, I I thought it was easy. You made it look easy. I assumed you knew I would return one day. Yoda chortled softly, without much humour. Elusive the future is. Stubborn. Much like detachment. And Happabores. He laughed for real then and Cantum felt the heavy air around them loosen, ease. Yoda was demonstrating letting go in real time, allowing it to be carried away like the fragrant plumes of smoke from their bonfire. And now for the second most important lesson having a youngling around will teach you, Yoda announced, how to share. See, I just thought that was really cool because, you know, as I said, I skipped over certain parts of it for context reasons and I don't want to spoil everything that happens there. Um, But it's really, really cool. I I really like what Yoda was saying and I just feel like anyone could learn something about that. Anyone could learn so much. You could apply that to anything. And I'm not saying that the Jedi way is necessarily the right way, but I think that what the High Republic authors are trying to do is establish that this was the golden age of the Jedi because they kind of had the balance right. There are parts in other books with like Elzar Mann who kind of has struggles with the dark side. And he's like my favorite character in the whole of the High Republic because of his struggles. He's an imperfect person. I always find those kind of characters intriguing a lot more most of the time than just the characters who are just purely good or purely evil. It's always the the ones who are in the grey area that intrigue me the most, the ones who struggle with it. And I just find that the lessons in what I just read really show that you can feel these emotions. Being a Jedi isn't about stifling emotions, isn't about not feeling them. It's when you feel them, you know how to process them, you know what to do with them. And obviously the Jedi way is to try and let go, try not to feel these attachments, try not to feel, you know, obsessive over people or things, try and let a calm wash over you. And I just think that's really cool and I just want to read that out to yourselves before I delve into the fully spoiler stuff uh, because I just thought it was really good but I think that's really going to be enough of my mild spoilery review so from here I'm going to give you the the full warning that I am going to be spoiling the Midnight Horizon so I'm going to talk about the plot details in a bit more information I'm going to reveal more stuff and uh, talk about generally the ending so that if you haven't picked up this book you do get a general idea because I know that with the High Republic being nine books as well as like 28 comics that are in the main run plus two or three miniseries as well as two standalone comics which are the marquee on row ones the two miniseries is trail of shadows and monster at temple peak i feel like there might be another one that i'm missing um off the top of my head but it's a lot of content plus the audio drama uh so if you want to listen on you will get a fairly good idea of what happens in this book um but if you've been paying attention to stuff, uh, you know, any of the promo and things, or if you read the other books, it's pretty, you, you can kind of guess what happens. But this is your spoiler warning. So this is going to be my final thoughts as we start to wrap up this review. Uh, it shouldn't be as long as the other two parts, but we'll see, because I do like to ramble. Uh, so my final thoughts on sort of the the book as a whole, as I said, I really like the Cantum size flashbacks, although I felt like there were two parts that could have kind of been pulled back a bit. Uh, for It's basically he leaves the Jedi Order, uh, he starts to experience like love and things. So he goes out, he kind of follows his dreams, he travels with like a circus for a while, he has a partner for a few years, um, and then they leave their partner, and then they kind of travel travel 
the galaxy kind of just doing their own thing. They work for a while and then eventually they come across a special little girl and they decide to take the special little girl back to Yoda or back to the Jedi Order. And then in doing that, they get reunited with Yoda and then they speak. And that's kind of what part of that conversation I just read to you was. So it's really interesting hearing that element of things. And this is, as I said, big spoilers, uh, but Cantum Sai, the special youngling that they found, was actually Lula Talasola, who was in an orphanage when they found them. So Lula would never have been picked up by the Jedi Order, or may have never been picked up by the Jedi Order without Cantum. So that's another layer of ways Cantum is deeply connected to his Padawan, Lula Talasola. And that how Lula also was the person who brought him back to the Order. But it's really interesting having someone leave the Order and then come back to it, and shows the open-mindedness of the Order at that time, compared to the prequel era Jedi, who obviously were very close-minded. Then you've got like Wreath and Ram, and their whole arcs are really interesting. They just kind of find themselves, they get more confident in themselves, especially Ram, and it's just fun to witness, but there's not anything that really stands out that's massive, um, apart from like if I had to read an entire scene to you, which obviously I'm not going to do. But I really like those. I like their action scenes. I like their interactions with the Force, and I like that Wreath is a bit more straight-faced, whereas Ram's a bit more, uh, let's say weird, but I, I don't use weird in a derogatory sense. I mean weird in a cool way, weird in a, an interesting way. And uh, Crash notices that when she speaks to Ram, there's like an inner, inner monologue part where she basically says something like Ram is like the coolest kid or the nicest kid around. It was either Ram or Zine. I can't, it was one of the two of them. When they're thinking about Ram, they just think he's one of the nicest, just best sort of younglings or kids around in a sense. He's not like a true youngling. Like younglings are what you call someone like a kid before a Padawan, uh, but without the minutiae of that, just a younger kid. And they just think he's amazing. So I really like that. And that the positivity of Ram is a real benefit to people around him. It's just really pleasant. So then you've got Comac and Cantum. So their whole dynamic kind of works because Cantum recounts when they left the Order and Comac never knew about this sort of stuff. So they talk about that and they bond while they're basically doing, in air quotes, adult stuff. Uh, so they're talking to certain politicians on Corellia. They're still trying to work out what's going on. And then there's like a big battle thing towards the end where they are heavily involved with. And that's really interesting. And then with Comac, once again, I'm, I'm going to stop saying spoilers so often, but this is spoilery. Um, but Comac, he, one of the reasons he was feeling a bit weird about stuff was because because he has a very close close connection with Orla Jereni. Now, she's a wayseeker. She also has a white double-bladed lightsaber. She's on the cover of the High Republic number. Oh, it's either 10, 11... I think it's either 10, 11, 12, or 13. It's one of those issues of the High Republic comics by Kevin Scott. She interacts with Keith Trennis quite a lot, and she's a really interesting character. She helps Elzar Mann quite a lot as well. And even in the young adult novel Padawan, uh, which I will be releasing a review on, but I imagine I'll just do that on Patreon because it won't be quite as in-depth as this. But the Padawan book by Kirsten White, which is really cool, there's a point in which Obi-Wan's whole journey is started because he finds something from Orla Jereni, and he hears like a a pad or something and she goes to a planet that he ends up going to in the book Padawan and then from there it kind of opens up the story but it's really interesting hearing about Orla Jereni and he calls her like Orla the Wayseeker and she is an amazing character in the High Republic a really interesting character but she dies in the Fallen Star and that hits Comac really hard when the stuff with Starlight Beacon all happens it's in the midst or just before a battle on Corellia so all of the Jedi on Corellia feel it happen they watch it on the hollows of an explosion happening on Starlight Beacon and that kind of makes some of them somewhat spiral and it causes a lot of panic and with Comac he is the one who's most affected by that and it seems like he, he basically knights Wreath and then leaves. That's that's how it ends. So it's interesting to see like what Comac is going to do with himself, um, and if we're going to see him pop up again in Phase Three of the High Republic. I suspect we will, but you know we'll see. And then you've got Crash's arc where she, you know, succeeds in her security stuff and she finds romance basically and then she learns to trust people. It's a really nice arc. I like it and Crash is a really cool character. Uh, and then we move on to the final one, which is Zine Morala and Zine, her finding herself and the things I spoke about earlier was that she finds herself falling in love with Lula Talasola and in the High Republic Adventures comics, you realize that Lula feels the same. And Lula's actually considering leaving the order just so she can try something with Zine Morala. And I assume that Canton would probably allow this because obviously he did something very similar in his youth. So it'd be interesting to see how that kind of unfolds in phase three. We don't really know how phase three, if there's going to be a time jump between phase one and phase three. I mean, I imagine there'll be some time that's passed, but we don't know if it's just going to be, you know, a few days or weeks, if it's going to be months or even years or even more like decades. We, we really just don't know. Uh, so it's going to be very interesting to see what happens then, but that's not going to be for at least a year and a half before we really know stuff about that because phase two has literally only just started. 
But seeing her interact with other Force users and things is always good seeing Zine. She's, she's a really interesting character. I kind of basically said everything I want to say about her prior because she's kind of a secondary character. She only really comes into it quite a lot, sort of halfway through. But uh, yeah, love a bit of Zine. So I found the ending of this book, it was a big old battle in Corellia, and I felt like it could have gone one or two ways. All the people that could have died. I suspected Zine and Ram wouldn't, and I didn't think that Wreath would. Then I was unsure about Comac and Cantum, because I thought it's a bit weird having a book which has so much plot and backstory about Cantum Psy if they were just going to kill him. I know sometimes shows like to do that, where you get the full idea of what the character's been through and then you kill him off. Like I know a lot of shows, I think Walking Dead generally does that. It's like if you have a one specifically character-centric episode near the finale or near the mid-series break, usually the next episode or two is them dying. Uh, so I know with TV shows they do that, um, but with this I just got the feeling they probably wouldn't kill off Cantum. I wasn't so sure about Comac, um, and then I didn't think they'd kill Crash. I, I thought that would have not really worked, but they didn't. Uh, uh, no one seemed to have died, really. Well, characters died, but no one seemingly major of the kind of main six I just mentioned. All of them survived, which is nice in different ways. But yeah, you get this big battle thing at the end. You get like a lot of people who owe Crash a favor. They come and help try and fight off the Nile because the Nile are basically going to the Corellian shipyards because their whole plan is to steal Corellian ships or Republic ships. And then when they go to help in air quotes Starlight Beacon, they'll think, oh, cool, you know, the Republic are coming to save us. Well, it'll actually be the Nile who have commandeered their ships and they can fight upon you know civilians and help vessels and all that sort of stuff so the plant in all of the wave three phase one books the high republic was basically starlight was the main thing that was happening there's an attack on starlight and then mark and road planned other stuff as well in mission to disaster it delved in a bit of that but listen to my review if you want to hear about that um, but in midnight horizon it was going to corellia and taking control of the republic's fleet and their shipyards and if they just succeeded then any survivors of starlight beacon would have almost certainly been killed by the nile fleet that obviously got stopped which is quite good um, but i obviously i remember reading for and start and then going into this and I was like well I know that there wasn't a Nile ship that kind of appeared and took him down so I knew that wasn't going to happen so you know I, I will say that with the third wave of the High Republic as much as I have enjoyed it I have felt that it is somewhat been the weakest just because the press that got released showed that the Starlight Beacon was going to blow up so you immediately know that from the start and it just took a bit away of things um, but I knew that they wouldn't show the Starlight Beacon blowing up if literally everyone was going to die on it. So it was just like, who's going to survive and how? Still a fun story to read, don't get me wrong. But yeah, just the press kind of ruined that a little bit for me. But it's very hard to avoid press. But yeah, that was the general plot. I mean... There's a lot more to it, you know, it delves into sort of Crash and her dealing with stuff, you've got Wreath and Cantum, and all of them are dealing with things I've kind of alluded to and touched upon across this, but the main through plot was the Nile, they orchestrated the, or somewhat had a hand in the Gus Talon Union Revolt stuff, as a distraction which sent all the Jedi and a lot of the police force and etc. to the moon of Corellia, Gus Talon, and then it left Corellia somewhat unguarded. This was all while the Nile were trying to seem like they've been basically beaten by the Jedi and there were barely any left, when in reality they were rallying their numbers and preparing for this big attack. And of that, the, there's a couple of Corellian officials who sided with the Nile for money or power or all these things and trying to stop other political rivals getting in by using the Nile. And then obviously the Nile betray them, which is standard, that's what they do. Uh, and then it's just the aftermath of all that and how the Jedi on there and how the people loyal to Crash, how they all fight off the Nile and get the ships back under control or destroy some of the ships. That's like the long and the short of the whole plot. There's a lot more to it than that because the whole Nile plot doesn't really come about until the end of part four. Like, you know something's happening, but you just don't really know what. And that's when it all kind of comes to fruition. So the first three parts, three to four parts, is just character stuff, flashbacks of Cantum, and kind of getting used to what the state of Corellia really is before the attack all happens. But yeah, I, I still really enjoyed it. I, I thought it was a good book. Um, but the ending right at the end, Yoda says that he's got grave news of a new threat. And I believe that's going to be the nameless. I, th I think the nameless are going to be the sort of the main focal point of the phase three of the High Republic. I know that phase two is going back and I think it's going to delve into why Mark on Rowe and his whole clan are so anti-Jedi, where the Nameless came from. We're going to get a bit more stuff about the Nameless or the Nameless or the Levelers or whatever you want to call them. I think there's like three names to them at the moment. I know there's going to be a mini-series of Phase 2 called The Nameless Terror, and so they're the main... At the end of The Rising Storm and The Fallen Star, and you get to see them in the end of the Marvel run by Kevin Scott comics of The High Republic, those three places are the best ways to get information on The Nameless, as well as the Marquion Row 
two comics, uh, which were written by Charles Saul. So Nameless are really interesting, but yeah, they're not in this at all. They're just mentioned at the end or alluded to. That's what I think Yoda's going to be talking about. But Yoda's come back. He's He was off for the whole of uh, the first wave, uh, the first phase of the High Republic. He was gone. You saw him in the High Republic Adventures, like Crash Land on a planet with Elder Tromac, and you just don't know what happened to him since. So I assume we're going to get a bit of information from him. I know that Kevin Scott is also, right now, uh, there's issues coming out, which is uh, the Yoda miniseries. I imagine it's four to six issues, as most miniseries are. I don't know anything about it, uh, but I know I'm going to read it and I've already pre-ordered them. So I wonder if maybe one of those is going to kind of tackle what happened to him in the High Republic. Uh, it'd be quite an interesting way of doing it, but we'll see. I'll tackle that on the show in 2023 when all the issues have come out. So uh, fun times there. But I don't really think, looking at my notes, there's much else to add. I could just reel off the whole plot, but that's not really that exciting for yourselves. But I just want to give you like a general idea of what happened on Corellia, what was happening in Midnight Horizon, the book itself, and some of my favourite elements of this book. So now that we've come to the end, I think my rankings of all the books is probably The Rising Storm is still my favourite. Then I think that's closely followed by Light of the Jedi. And then after that, it's kind of hard to... Because they're, they're, they're all really good, as I said. But I think after that, probably the junior novels are my favourite. I mean, Race to Crash Point Tower I loved because it's like a, a different perspective of The Rising Storm. And I loved that book. So I think Race to Crash Point Tower is probably my next favourite. Then I really loved A Test of Courage and Mission to Disaster. I think they both really surprised me. So I think those two would be next. Then I think it would probably... So it's kind of basically the three adult books. Actually, I think I enjoyed most of the junior novels more than The Fallen Star. So I think it might be The Rising Storm, Light the Jedi, the three junior novels starting with Race to Crash Point Tower, then Test of Courage, then Mission to Disaster, then probably The Fallen Star, then probably Midnight Horizon, then Out of the Shadows, then Into the Dark. I think. I think Out of the Shadows and Into the Dark are both fairly even i mean my night horizon is pretty close as well but i think i enjoyed this a smidge more than those other two but i did just read this and uh, obviously i read the other ones like six months ago and a year ago so memory is a little bit hazy of my enjoyment but all of them are minimum seven out of ten like i think minimum seven out of ten the rising storm however i think was like 9.5 out of ten i think that book is phenomenal and i think i can give this book an eight so i think it's rising storm like nine and a half then like the jedi like nine then Race to Crash Point Tower, probably a nine. Then Mission to Disaster and Test of Courage, probably eight and a half. Then Fallen Star, eight and a half as well. This book an eight. Then probably Into the Dark and Out of the Shadows, probably seven and a half, I think. That's generally probably what I'd go after reading all of these books. But they are all brilliant. Like, I've never been so excited to read Star Wars books than I have been with The High Republic. Like, when I get an individual book, like when I started reading the Aftermath books, it was really, really cool and interesting being able to kind of see what happened next. But because obviously the sequel trilogy, there were certain elements I knew that had to happen and couldn't happen. And it's been the same with a lot of the other books. You know, the Ahsoka novel was cool, but I knew what the inevitable fate of Ahsoka was, or at least sort of after that book, I knew she survived. I knew she wasn't going to die in the Ahsoka novel. Same with like Master and Apprentice and Padawan. They're both prequel novels in a sense. It's just there's been a lot of Star Wars books that have been using characters that we're already familiar with. And although that's fun and that's good, like Last Shot by Daniel Jose Older, that was a cool book. I enjoyed it. But because we know Lando and Han survive, then it just took a lot of the, the tension away. It was just like, well, are these peripheral characters going to die? It's like, well, they might. But if they're flying the Falcon, it's quite unlikely that the Falcon's going to get completely blown up and then put back together again for, you know, The Force Awakened and no one mentions it. It just wasn't going to happen. But with The High Republic, it's anyone can die in essence, apart from Yoda. You know, apart from Yoda, Yariel Poof, Maz Kanata, Jabba the Hutt, and then there's a couple of other, like there were just a few other characters that are super old at the time of the High Republic that we saw, mainly in the prequels um, or past that. So we know they don't die, but none of the main characters, you know, they're all going to die of old age before the prequel era. So we know that either they're going to die in some horrible way, like some of the characters already have, mainly the Fallen Star, or if they're going to, you know, just live a nice old age and pass away peacefully. So uh, yeah, I've been really, really enjoying the High Republic. Phase one has been absolutely fantastic. I just got a notification actually that the Starlight Stories trade paperback is being sent to me. So that is the collection of stories of comics that was in Star Wars Insider, which obviously is a monthly magazine that I've never picked up or read. I've got enough Star Wars content to read as well as reading loads of behind the scenes stuff. Um, um, but there's comics that were about the High Republic set there. I've not read any of them, so I'm very intrigued by that. I hope they're good, because I don't really want to buy a trade paperback and read loads of stuff and then not actually be that amazing. Um, but So I might be tackling that next week. It just kind of depends on the stories and how big the trade paperback is and what it contains and how I'm going to structure them, because I think quite a lot of the comics are quite short, so I don't fully know how I'm going to delve into that. But I'll figure that out when I get it. Um, otherwise, I'll be doing the... 
uh, sort of collection of comics that are set before Hidden Empire, after Crimson Reign, before Hidden Empire, you know, things set in the original trilogy era, Dr. Aphra, Darth Vader, Bounty Hunters, and the main Star Wars run. So that's probably what I'm going to do going forward. But um, yeah, that's basically the end of the Middle Horizon review. So please let me know what you thought. Have any of you listened to the audiobooks of The High Republic or the audio drama of Tempest Runner, uh, the Lorna D kind of book? Uh, or have you been reading the books? Have you only been picking up the comics? Have you only listened to me? Have Has the only insight into The High Republic been stuff that I've told you? I'd be really interested to know of my listeners because these reviews do get a fair amount of listens. I'd be really interested to hear from any of you, whether you're a new listener or someone who's been listening to Star Wars comics and canon since the start. Please tell me what you think of The High Republic, if you've read any of it, and your general thoughts on that regard. Obviously, if you want to support the show, uh, you can do it in a variety of ways. You can share on social media this episode with your friends and people like that, or just your followers. They're not necessarily your friends. You, know, you can tell people about it in real life, obviously. Tell your friends about Styles Comics and Canon or the Genuine Chit Chat YouTube channel, which has got every episode of Styles Comics and Canon on there, and they're all in special playlists. There's a High Republic playlist, there's a book review playlist, there's a playlist all about Darth Vader. So every comic appearance of Darth Vader in Canon, obviously. Um, so if you want to delve into the world of Styles Comics and Canon more, YouTube is one of the best places to do it. Just of how it's structured and, ch- and playlists and things like that and obviously there are video versions of genuine chit chat conversations and a few other bits and pieces there as well so always good to check out youtube and please subscribe to youtube.com slash genuine chit chat that would be really cool in addition to that well we've got obviously reviews on apple podcasts and good pods and you can rate on spotify if you're listening on the feed of comics in motion on any of those podcast apps please review and do all those things it really helps out my show as well as all the other shows on this amazing network then what else have we got well uh, as well as sharing on social media follow me at genuine chit chat on instagram twitter and on facebook subscribe to the youtube channel slash genuine chit chat uh, as well as doing all the things i just said about reviews and etc and telling people uh, there's one big way you could really really help out the show and that's going over to patreon.com slash genuine genuine chit chat so for as little as one pound a month you will get access to an audio exclusive feed and loads of other stuff there's photos i put on there of like places i've been and trips and stuff that i don't always put on social media videos and photos of my dog slash puppy uh, willow and my tortoise wicket but the main thing that people like about it there's two elements one is my book reviews so i do legends book reviews obviously not on here so there's the darth bane trilogy there's darth plagueis and there's shatterpoint and there's more to come i'm currently listening to the audiobook of rogue squadron so the first in the x-wing series or first in the Rogue Squadron series, depending on uh, when you consume that content. Uh, but it's written by Michael Stackpole and it's set, you know, 10 years after Return of the Jedi. I think it's about 10 years or thereabouts. And it's about Wedge Antilles and Rogue Squadron and Corrin Horn and people like that. And Corrin Horn actually appeared in the Kenobi series, oddly enough. He was the kid with the mum when Kenobi was trying to get off world and then uh, came into contact with the sort of guy who was pretending to be a Jedi when he wasn't. I forget his name, but uh, Corrin Horn was actually there, fun fact. So Corrin Horn is now canon and obviously the Rogue Squadron book. Uh, or this Rogue Squadron film is still in, in theory coming out. It's meant to be directed by Paddy Jenkins, who made the Wonder Woman films, but keeps getting delayed. And a lot of people are like, oh, it's like, are they actually going to make it? So I don't know. But back on track, uh, patreon.com slash genuine chit chat. So I do uh, Legends book reviews on there. Uh, I also do Canon book reviews that I don't often release on this feed. So sometimes if I have a quiet week or I'm really busy or whatever, then I may put one of the book reviews on this feed, as you've heard from Last Shot and uh, Dark Disciple. I think I put both of those on this feed slash on YouTube. But there's a couple that are on there that you can't listen to anywhere else at the moment. In the future, maybe they'll come out here. Uh, but if you want to hear those, so the canon ones, uh, there's A New Dawn, which will be being released, I think, tomorrow. So the day after this comes out. Uh, and then also there's a few others on there. But it's mainly legend stuff that I put on there that I don't put anywhere else. You can't find them uh, anywhere else on the internet unless someone's poached it and put up for pirating. But I don't really check those places. So um, there's legend stuff on there. And then the other thing that people really like about my Patreon is Afterthoughts. So myself and Megan, who's appeared on lots of comics and motion episodes has appeared on in the band books week by tonya todd and has appeared on numerous episodes of genuine chit chat as well she and i do an episode at least once a week during halloween released like i think 14 episodes or something uh, so it's like one every two or three days and in essence we watch movies or tv shows or live performances of stuff and we talk about our thoughts on that and we also talk about when we go on holidays and road trips and going abroad and things like that so there's like a 40 minute long discussion on our trip to malta there i went to the isle of Wight zoo did like zookeeper for a day so we spoke about that experience uh, we've seen book of mormon so we spoke about that the great british bake-off musical we talk about that we just talk about all of the star wars movies uh, we talk about all the harry potter movies uh, we talk about that like, each episode they're normally between sort of 10 and 20 minutes long depending we also just recorded one on Friends. It was like a 20-minute discussion on Friends because I'd never seen it in full before. We finished that recently. We've done other TV shows and things as well. We've done The Witcher. Uh, we've done certain documentary series. 
there's murder among the mormons is one of them we just watched train wreck woodstock 99 so probably gonna do one on that as well loads of variety of things but it's me and megan talking having a bit of banter having a bit of fun people love hearing us communicate and megan like ripping on me so if you want to get there's 120 afterthoughts out i think at the moment uh, that includes my book reviews and the stuff that i do with megan so if you want to get access to that there's been i think i've been doing patreon now for it's either a year and a half I think it's a year and a half now. So it's like a year and a half's worth of content. So there's hours and hours and hours of content. And for as little as one pound a month, you'll get access to all of it. You get a link to an audio exclusive RSS feed, and then you can put that in any podcast player of your choice, or you can listen through the Patreon app or on the Patreon browser. And from that, you get access to all of these amazing things I've just been talking about. So please consider checking that out, because if you want to support Styles Comics and Canon and help fuel uh, how much it costs to buy all of these comics and books and all that sort of stuff, not including my time and things, please consider doing it. It means the absolute world to me. And I know I've got a couple new patrons recently. Uh, so I hugely, hugely appreciate that. Shout out to Brett Scott, Spider Dan, and also Scott Weatherly. All three of you are gems, as well as everyone else on Patreon, as well as everyone even considering checking out Patreon. Uh, but if you want to see like an insight into what it's like link in the description to mine and megan's first watch of our tom hanks watch Uh, so we decided to watch the vast majority of tom hanks movies Uh, we start with big that's the free one you can go to bit.ly slash tom hanks one and you can just listen to that completely for free and then we've done all the ones from big up so like turner and hooch and joe versus the volcano and sleepless in seattle and apollo 13 and toy story as well we've just done Uh, so we're going through all of those tom hanks flicks as well so please consider Instead of checking out patreon.com slash genuine chit chat please follow me on social media at genuine chit chat subscribe to my youtube channel as well and share the love with all your friends and things so just thank you so much for listening as always as i said next week will either be the starlight stories from star wars insider or it will be a collection of the comics in between crimson rain and hidden empire from dr afra darth vader bounty hunters or star wars and then we'll kind of go out from there because i'm going to have to start doing the high republic phase two review soon uh, because i've just got quest for the hidden city delivered i think path of deceit is being delivered in the next like week or two and then convergence is coming in a few weeks after that as well so i'm gonna have to really get on uh, the phase two book reviews as well as doing the hidden empire crossover as well as doing all the other stuff that i've been doing as well but thank you so much for listening as always my friends i appreciate each and every one of you listening all the way to the very end i'll talk to you next week uh, with whatever i decide on doing make sure you check out the and or discussion show that's every week either hosted by myself or jack or this week just gone it's actually hosted by spider dan because both myself and jack are unavailable unfortunately Uh, but that should have been released the day before this has come out Uh, so make sure you check those out too or you can watch the video versions on my youtube channel Uh, and uh, yeah as always i appreciate all of you listening i'll talk to you next week and may the force be with you The intro for Star Wars Comics and Canon is arranged by myself, Mike Burton, and the backing music was made by Eric Matias of soundimage.org. You have just experienced host, creator, everything else of genuine chit-chat, and also the host and creator of Star Wars Comics and Canon, found on the Comics in Motion podcast, Mike Burton.